So I'm now going to go on to my sort of second sort of lesson, major lesson, which is uh, you can't be effective in any organization you run. You can't take up any leadership position on your own. Um, yeah, despots um, don't survive on their own either. Uh, and in the Jewish community, you, know, you can't be autocratic, and not this community in particular. And so you have to build allies and find good people to do it with you. So that's my second major sort of lesson, common lesson I've learned. You've got to build allies and find people who can do it with you. And the times that I've stumbled is when I haven't actually built allies. When I've tried to actually, through force of personality, simply try to actually get my way. And it just doesn't work. Uh, and it doesn't work for a very long time. And I say a couple of things to you in this context. And the reason why it's important is because every conviction that you have, every belief that you have, needs to be tested in secure territory. And if you don't have people around you, if you don't build these allies, you can't test your convictions securely. You can't test your convictions in a way where you will not be exposed if those convictions and those thoughts about where you want to take an organization or what you want to do turn out actually to be pretty stupid ideas. And having allies allows you the secure territory to test those convictions and to robustly make sure that when you finally implement them, that they actually have a good chance of working. And secondly, every idea needs sort of multiple disciples. Um, ideas, to propagate ideas, to get things accepted, you need a lot of people to actually believe in them. You need to build a consensus, and a consensus is built in the grassroots and it's built across leadership. And, uh, and, that's, and having allies allows you to build multiple disciples because your allies have their own allies. Uh, and if you can build that consensus, you can go forward. Uh, if you can't build that consensus, you sort of start to find nothing gets happened, nothing happens. And every initiative therefore needs a wide arena of support. Um, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little later is the question of common architecture. Uh, and I'm going to say to you that you know, common architecture is vital to, to be addressed in this community, but we will not be able to make any changes unless we have sort of the Jew in the pew, our grassroots Jew who actually accepts that proposition uh, as well. Uh, and common leadership is actually about building that consensus at, at the grassroots. So when I say that every conviction needs to be tested in secure territory, um, I say so because it's a small but very complex community. It's a highly educated community. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, uh, it's a divided community. This is probably one of the most divided diaspora communities that I've, that I've come across. And I obviously know the South African community very well, but I know other diaspora communities well as well. And, and, and the UK community uh, is really riven. It, it's got, it has divisions which, which are stark and which surprise me at, at times. How the, the passion that goes in, into the, the sense of, of division that, that people have. Uh, and one, but has, one has to recognize that, and I say that as objectively and not as a criticism, one has to recognize that, and because of that, having a, being able to test things in a secure environment is even more important than, than ever before. It's a community also which doesn't like change. Yeah. This is a community which basically has a, a tradition and a history. Um, and it's in the scheme of things, in the context of the whole history of the United Kingdom, the history of this community is actually not that long. But let me tell you, for most of the Asian communities, well, those that have existed for a longer period of time all dead. Um, unfortunately, because of the Holocaust. And so the Jewish community of the United Kingdom is actually one of the oldest communities. It has a history going back 300 plus years, you know, since uh, it was allowed back into the country by Oliver of Cromwell. And it developed a set of institutions which derive from its life in, 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 the, in, in Eastern Europe and, and Germany and, uh, and, and, and Poland and other areas where it came from, which was a life which said that if we, for, we, for us to survive here, we have to build a parallel uh, set of civic structures to maintain our common life. And so the whole of, of, of UK Jewry is actually based on sort of its own government, its own civil service, its own sort of parliament, its own representation and things like that. Now, if you think of for instance, the countries which, which did the best after the Second World War, for those countries where the vested interests were destroyed, Japan and Germany, were so destroyed by um, um, you know, the, the, the impact of the Second World War, that the reconstruction of those countries, those societies, and those economies were done absent vested interest, and they reconstructed in the most profound way. So Japan has stumbled a bit, but Germany today is you know, the powerful European economy. Those countries were, in fact, which maintained status quo, the United Kingdom, France, 
Italy and others, I'm afraid we sort of you know, continue to muddle along because of vested interests. Try and make change in the Italian political system, it's almost impossible. Try and make change in the UK Jewish community, it's also <laughs> <laughs> um, And therefore, um, you need to be able to again come back to testing your, your thing in a very secure territory before you take a brave step to try and, try and effect change. And so new ideas need to be resilient and robust. And sub lesson number five is sort of don't overreach yourself one step at a time. One of my big mistakes a couple of years ago, it's ironic that we're in a Jewish care facility, is to try and convince the care providers that they had to get together and take a look at what the care needs of this community were going to be over the next 20 years, what the demographics were going to, were going to create in terms of um, the number of people who are going to need care, what the quality of care this community was going to require, who was going to fund that, how could we secure funding, etc. But I overreached myself, I tried to do it too quickly, and they basically told me to take a hike. Uh, and it is only now that we're getting that very important, that very crucial discussion on the table, on the table again. So don't overreach yourself one step at a time. Every idea needs disciples. So build allies, every idea needs disciples. So if you cannot get enthusiasm from your, from your immediate circle, drop the idea. Um, yeah, I've, I've tried many things, I mean, I've had pushback. Um, I've, I've sometimes said, no, well, you're wrong, I'm right, and we're going to do it, and it's always ending in a mess. So generally speaking, if your inner circle tells you it's a bad idea, even if you're convinced that it's, it's a great thing, just drop it, because you'll get no support, and ultimately the thing will fail. Um, you can't sell something alone, essentially. Yeah. There's no basis in any society of one person getting up with a force of personality and setting a concept of one. Um, yeah, perhaps Winston Churchill was the only one in the, in the, in the you know, in sort of 1940 who could stand up and say a retreat from Dunkirk was a victory. But uh, otherwise, you know, mere mortals can't, can't actually do it. So, so sub lesson number six is you've got to choose your allies carefully. So you've got to choose people who are aligned to your thinking. Um, but they must represent the community. It must represent the broadness of the community. It mustn't allow you to go into a sort of sense of group thing. Uh, because in that sort of environment, uh, you will end up uh, going down the wrong track. Um, every initiative needs to have a wide network amongst the sort of the grassroots of the community. So you need to choose beyond your allies, organizations who are going to be your champions. So if you want to do something, find a set of people, maybe even people who traditionally would not be allied with you, to actually champion that cause. Because if you can do that, you've got a, you've got a head start uh, to being successful. And it takes time to build consensus. Uh, and we just have to accept that, you know, especially again, I mean, you know, in the nature of, of vested interests, to overcome vested interests, it cannot be done with a tank or a bazooka lobbing shells into them. It's going to be done very slowly, very carefully, demonstrating step by step value proposition that you can deliver through change. Mm -hmm. So the sub-lesson number seven is sort of invest time with the enemy in inverted commas. Um, show them respect, in other words, recognize what the issues are and work with them in terms of trying to demonstrate value. And in that way, things will get through. So that ends sort of the, the, the sort of second major lesson in terms of building allies. The third area I want to get onto is to as a leader, you've got to be involved in the business of sorting out the communal architecture. No person should take up communal leadership in the Jewish community in the United Kingdom without having that as part of his remit. Because the communal architecture is grotesquely unprepared to cope with the UK Jewish community today. We are a community of 300,000 people. It's a community which has been in decline. That decline has been arrested somewhat, but that arresting of that decline is a bit of a fiction because it's been arrested through the growth of the Haredi community. And the Haredi community, and I have all the respect for, for committed and, and, and devout Jews, so I, I make this point not as a point of criticism, but as a point of reality, is creating their own sets of issues in relation to dependencies and, and, and other disequilibriums, which the mainstream community is ultimately going to have to take on board and to deal with. But what is happening is that our center the, the center, the, 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 the sort of broad center of the Jewish community, which sustained it for so many hundreds of years, is actually dissipating. 
um, and that uh, and you can see that through you know the stratification in the center both the the orthodox and the uh, and the non orthodox centers synagogue movements how their membership in fact is stratified and in real terms has declined uh, significantly so uh, the common law architecture needs to be sorted out um, and and obviously the elephant in the room is the question of the board of deputies and the Jewish leadership council uh, clearly it is not simply not sustainable in my view to continue to have uh, every every sort of two months grenades being lobbed uh, in the boardroom plenary about the Jewish Leadership Council, and it's just not good for anybody to have uh, this constant uh, this constant sense of attack and a uh, sense of, uh, of vulnerability uh, on the board side, uh, and this constant issue of the of people in the JLC saying we'll stuff them and you know, you, you know, we, you had to do a job and you know, let's do the right job. It's just not sustainable to carry on like that. It's a waste of good effort and good energy. Um, and the issue really, of course, always is representation versus uh, versus leadership. It's, it's more complex than that, but it's something that needs to be dealt with. The other thing that needs to be dealt with is that we cannot continue to have a charity a day uh, being set up in the Jewish community. I mean, you know, last time we, we had sort of 3,000 charities operating in our community. It's just completely outrageous that this is happening. It's, it's, uh, it, it's creating huge stress and strain on the community for a couple of reasons. First, we don't have enough people in our community who can manage that. We don't have enough Jewish civil servants to do it. We don't have enough lay people to manage it effectively. So many of these organizations are start, they create work environments, and then they implode and, and we end up with, 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 with the problem. I cannot tell you the number of people that walk through the JLC doors asking for money because their funding proposition can no longer be met. So they started with great enthusiasm. But there's a school down the road in Golders Green, which is now taking in non-Jewish kids less than sort of a year after it's opened its doors. Well, some organization has thought that it actually should be there. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So we can't continue on that basis. But we will not stop it unless we get a handle on common architecture and prioritization. And there is a lack of prioritization in this, in this community. So, sort out the common architecture which means address the board and the JLC structures, address the plethora of charities, and trying to get an area of, of, of prioritization. So the board and the JLC, yeah, what can I say to you? Um, I think uh, that the JLC, from my perspective, does a great job. Um, I think the board um, of, of, of deputies um, is an organization which certainly represents the views of a number of Jews in this, in this community, and is seen by many of them as being the legitimate representative body. And it's a distraction for this, uh, for this um, sort of argy-bargy uh, to continue, and certainly a distraction uh, that we have, um, you know, common newspapers, you know, delighting in, 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 uh, in creating a sense of, of, of this all about.